Well, for many years we didn't think it was possible. For many years the idea was the oceans are so big they can absorb anything. And uh, we learned in the 60s, the 50s and the 60s, that the, they don't absorb everything, that it's pollution gets concentrated in close to continents. We put out pollutants and they don't just disperse equally around the whole oceans. So areas get highly polluted and causing damage to marine life, damage to people. So it's not the case. We used to think that and we were wrong. Well, in addition to pollution of all kinds, we've d destroyed habitats. We've taken important habitats like salt marshes or mangroves and replaced them with seawalls. These are habitats right in the intertidal area, habitats that are crucial to lots of living things and we've just taken them away and destroyed habitat. And we've also uh, overfished many species for our own consumption. And it's possible to regulate fishing scientifically uh, and that is beginning to take hold, but uh, there are many species that have been way overfished uh, and continue to be. Well, we need them for fish if we want to eat seafood, not just fish, but shellfish as well. We need oxygen and a good part of the oxygen that we breathe in the air was produced by tiny phytoplankton in the ocean. We also uh, have many tropical countries that depend on their healthy marine environments for tourism. Uh, people come down there to fish, they come down there to snorkel or scuba dive or swim. And if we've wrecked those environments, the economies of those countries will be in very bad shape. Well, there's some chemicals that we've known about and worried about for over 40 years. Uh, we can thank Rachel Carson for pointing this out to the general public. Uh, and these are kinds of pesticides that were in common use after World War II. Uh, chemicals like DDT is the most famous, but there are dozens of others that are chemically related to DDT. Uh, and one reason they were thought to be so good was that they didn't break down in the environment. So a farmer or a homeowner with the lawn or whatever didn't have to spray every couple of weeks, could spray once because the stuff stayed there. Now that seemed like a good thing, but when then you realize that the stuff washes into the water and is destroying and damaging aquatic habitats and environment and killing fish, et cetera, the fact that it doesn't break down and doesn't go away is no longer a good thing. That turns into a bad thing. Uh, so that's one class of chemicals. There are other chemicals that are industrial chemicals that are chemically related to um, the DDT type pesticides that weren't used as pesticides but were used for various industrial purposes. And the one famous one there is PCBs that were used in the electric capacitors and you know stuff uh, transmitting electric power. And there was, uh, you know, major pollution from a plant up the Hudson River. A General Electric left a big mess of PCBs in the, in the middle 70s. People became aware of that. And then there are, of course, metals from mining, from industrial purposes. They never break down their elements. And we have toxic kinds of chemicals, metals like mercury, and lead and cadmium uh, that are harmful to not just marine life but to people as well. 
and then a whole slew of new ones that, well, not necessarily new ones, they're new, newly emerging concern about them. They've been around for quite a while, but nobody paid any attention to them before. And, and some of these are flame retardants, some of them are um, some of these san hand sanitizers in some rooms and bathrooms. You can get a spritz or something. That's got a, a chemical in it called triclosan, which is really nasty. I mean, it's not going to hurt your skin, you know, but it washes off and, and, and it can be, it, it's got a lot of problems. So there's this, we're surrounded in a sea of chemicals. Some of them are, you know, do work in different ways to be harmful, and then some are not that harmful, but we're talking about the ones that are problems. <laughs> yes, uh, we have a sick system in terms of approving new chemicals. We have had for, um, since the middle 70s, a toxic chemical law that was ineffective. And in 2015, Congress finally improved the law. It still got problems, but they passed and Obama signed a revised toxic chemical law. And they named it after Frank Lautenberg, who was a longtime senator from New Jersey, who pushed this law during his career. But it, it passed, after he, he died before it ever got passed. But um, the current administration, I have very little faith this is gonna do anything under this new improved law. I doubt that the current administration is gonna do anything. Absolutely, You've heard about the Exxon Valdez, heard about the uh, BP, gusher in the Gulf of Mexico. So certainly the transport of oil and the uh, offshore drilling for oil inevitably has accidents and there have been oil spills uh, forever and some of them have been more spectacular than others. Uh, they have um, you know, we hear about the headlines when something is happening and there's, you know, the birds get covered with oil and the people bring them in and the sea otters and, you know, if it's in Alaska, it's sea otters, if it's elsewhere, it's birds, and try to rehabilitate these animals and, you know, whales die and the oil is more on the surface than lower down in a spill from a ship. Um, so it's those animals, the big vertebrates that people relate to, that are killed and injured severely initially. And then frequently, uh, one method of treating an oil spill is to put what's called dispersants on it. And dispersants make this oil that's floating on the top into little pieces, and now it spreads throughout the whole water column. So you don't see a slick on top anymore. And they say, okay, well, we fixed it. Well, the fact is, maybe it's not on the top anymore, but now it's dispersed throughout the water, and um, it's damaging everything that's living below. And what happened with the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Deepwater Horizon gusher there, was they dispersed it right at the bottom where it was coming out, so that instead of really going through the whole water column, it sat on the bottom. This whole sludge of oil sat on the bottom and did huge damage to anything that was living in or on or near the bottom. So you can't make it go away. And another thing about oil spills is that if it sinks into sand or mud, uh, it doesn't degrade. If it, if it comes onto rocks with waves battering it, eventually it degrades and it's gone. But when it sinks down below the surface, it ends up in an area with no oxygen and it just can stay for decades and decades. Um, there was a minor oil spill 
I think it was 68 or 69, in Falmouth, Massachusetts. Made no newspapers, it was minor. But it happened in a place where there's lots of marine scientists at Woods Hall. So, and the people knew the biology of this area before the spill. And so they studied it after. Very seldom is there a case where you knew what was there before and then you can see what's there after. And they documented how many years it took to come back to normal. And in a place like Alaska, it takes much longer because it's colder. And, you know, there are still effects being noticed in the Prince William Sound, where the Exxon Valdez accident was in 1989. They're still seeing effects. It's not killing things. It's not dead bodies, but embryo development of fishes is impaired. They're not reproducing as well. Things like that. So it's very long-lasting, low-level effects after decades, after a spectacular thing. Now, coal, we don't have coal wells. Coal, we don't make drill for coal in the ocean. But uh, coal companies are allowed now to spill their waste into streams. And the streams can now go back, go out to the ocean. And when coal is burned, it, really, it makes air pollution. And what goes into the air when it rains comes down on land, comes down in the ocean. So we have impacts of both oil and coal in the ocean.